Welcome to In Edina, a program about the city of Edina's people, places, and activities. I'm your host, Lillian McDonald. Welcome to the new year, and we have lots of things to talk about. We're going to start with a legislative preview, and joining us now are two guests. Uh, we'd like to welcome Representative Neil Peterson and also Representative Ron Earhart. Thank you very much for joining us on nice In Edina. Nice to be with you. Really Thank appreciate you. having you. You know what? The session is just underway, and the elections are just over. But there's lots happening. I'm going to start with you because I know we've got an old issue that's coming back on the front burner, <laughs> campaign finance oh, reform. Yes, yes, Tell us is. all about it. What are you going to do? Uh, there's a group of us working on campaign finance reform. And basically, it's disclosure. It's trying to get more transparency into campaigns. And the part that we're trying to get disclosure on is the one-time money that comes into a campaign, typically in the last two weeks of a campaign. And typically, it's directed at a candidate, and they're trying to dump. It's when big money comes in from a, a lobby group or a special interest group or even money we don't even know where it comes from comes in. A classic example was the governor's race this last year when the last week of the campaign there was a tremendous expenditure against the uh, the candidate hatch and it's sort of a way to influence opinions it obviously. was and it's uh, postcards it's mailings it's tv ads it takes huge money and we saw this last year in even the legislative campaigns like in ron and my district there would be thirty or forty thousand dollars spent on mailings and postcards and typically to destroy a candidate and so we're working on now on disclosing, if you choose to do that, a group chooses to do that, they must disclose. Right now we have it written in four days. They would okay. have four days to report how much money they're spending and where it's coming from, at least in the transparency. And so it doesn't matter which party you belong to. No, that's it's right. It's fair both ways. Then. It's both ways. It's it an old issue, though, and it comes up every issue. year. And there's a group of second-term legislators uh, from the metro area, uh, two of the ladies from the North Metro, and I are working. We've put together a group because at the end of the day, we need 110 or 120 votes in both houses to get it approved. So what we need are allies, not enemies. So our job now is to put together a bill that's simple, understandable, and we can get it passed by 120 people in both houses. Well, more information for voters is always Absolutely. good information. Absolutely. All right, good. And you have transportation on the mind. Well, I certainly do. This is the second session that we're advancing a bipartisan bill to uh, add additional monies uh, into uh, the transportation uh, field. Uh, MnDOT, the Minnesota Department of Transportation, uh, studies show that they are short about a billion dollars a year in the, for the trunk highway system, uh, as you know, we have a, more than a million people uh, moving into the metro area in mm -hmm. the next uh, 20 years, and we have to undo the congestion and uh, bottlenecks that we have here. And in rural Minnesota, they need uh, uh, heavier roads for crops to market and a lot of safety concerns out there. So mm -hmm. the bipartisan bill will call for in some tax increases. Uh, and some optional uh, increases for uh, counties. And of course that may help in Edina where we have some bottlenecks at 169 and 494, our classic 62 and 35 exchange, roads around 50th and France in particular. Is that what this money would go to to help here? Well, we certainly, if we get enough of it, we certainly will expect that the crosstown will be finished. Right now the crosstown is two or three years behind and they've been trying to get money from other projects uh, outstate, which doesn't make them very happy, and they tried to borrow money from the contractors, and that doesn't work. We also have the 169 and 494 interchange, which has been delayed uh, any number of years. There are numerous projects, bottleneck projects in the metro area. We also need uh, money for our transit system, which is quite far behind uh, other cities of comparable size to uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul. and uh, This might be too simplistic, but wouldn't it just be easier to just pick one project and get that one done and move on to the next one? <laughs> <laughs> well, it just seems so global, transportation. Right. Well, know. it doesn't really work that way because they're all interrelated. You know, a transit yeah. system is related to your road system and vice versa, and so uh, you kind of have to move. And uh, we're, when we're doing road projects, 
You have to look out 10 or 15 years for yeah, acquisition yeah. of uh, Of course. Plants. I just know I have my pet peeves on my highways, and I've got my own personal interest right. in mine. I'm a commuter, too, so I'm yeah. interested in roads, as we all are. Yeah. Let's travel over to the Mall of America just really right. quickly and talk a little bit what's happening there since your district involves Bloomington as well. The mall is doubling in size. They are in the process. The city council has heard it. They've approved the development project. The package is now coming over to the legislature, to the tax committee, which is chaired by Representative Lincheski uh, from Bloomington, uh -huh. uh, to look for tax increment financing to help underwrite the initiation of the project. Of course, I was mayor at the groundbreaking and opening of the mall, so here it comes again. What goes around comes around, so we're wow. back in the mall discussions. I, it's hard to believe that thing can be any bigger. Right. Holy smokes. Well, yeah. I'm looking forward to uh, progress on the mall. Progress on campaign finance reform, progress on the highways and the roads. We'll have you back at the end of the session to see how it all shakes out. I want to thank you both for coming on In a Dine today. Good luck. Great pleasure. Thank you. Take care. Yeah. Well, if you live in Minnesota, you probably like hockey or you know a hockey fan. And there's a new game going on called Minnesota Special Hockey, and we have two women here to talk about this great game that uh, you started, actually, and got going for players, and you have a player on the team. Joining us, we have board member uh, Jane Cashin and the founder of Minnesota Special Hockey, we have Susie Miller. Thank you very much for joining us on Inadina. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, let's talk about hockey. What is Minnesota Special Hockey? Why is it so special? Minnesota Special Hockey is ice hockey for individuals with developmental disabilities. And, 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 and they play the regular hockey games? or yeah, it's stand-up hockey, on skates, regular equipment, regular gear. How did this get started? We have individuals in the state that were really looking for ice hockey, mm -hmm. not individuals with disabilities, not looking for the sled hockey, but looking for stand-up ice mm -hmm. hockey. Or floor hockey. They wanted to get on the ice. Yes. So they got skates, helmets, they've got shin pads, elbow pads, and, and, and hockey sticks, sticks and pucks. You've yes. got to have the stick to, to make the score. And uh, you've got players ranging from what ages? We have a five-year-old and we have a 42-year-old. And all the players play on the same team? Yep, everybody mm -hmm. is welcome of all abilities. We have, we'll match up lines. Uh -huh. Instead of matching up an A team and an A team, we'll match up lines within both teams. Okay, and there are two teams, right? The Stingers yep. and, and the, the Polars. Polars. And how many skaters all together then? We have 37 skaters. Okay, all right. And they come from, was it all over the metro area then to play? Yep, they're all over the metro. We'll, we'll include anyone from anywhere and hopefully develop even more teams in the future, but primarily we have a south team and a north team. So okay. This program is like, what, about a year old now? It started last March, and it was just a trial six-week program. This program really actually started in November. It sounds like it's really grown. The season runs November through March, mm -hmm. and there are four games in every season, right? For this year. Okay. Hopefully more in the future. Yes, this year we had to more. start with skaters just learning to skate at sure, the beginning absolutely. of the season. And then you have a player on the team, Sam, right? Yes, my okay. son Sam, he's 14 years old. He, for years, watched his older sister skate and was called Stick Boy on the team. And uh, now he gets to be in the ice and they watch him, so he loves it. Oh, yeah. Just loves it. And, and this is really important because, you know, like all team sports, it builds confidence, team play, mm -hmm. you learn a new sport, you have a little bit of fun out there, too. But, you know, it also takes a lot of work. How do you run a program like this? We recruited numerous volunteers. For a while there it was pretty much one-to-one, -one, one volunteer to one skater on wow. the ice. And it's tons of volunteers, it's tons of fundraising, community involvement, people with and without disabilities or parents with and without disabilities. This is great. So you have people that are embracing this sport from different perspectives and abilities. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Who coaches? We have Rick Carlson as our coach for our stingers. And he was a Special Olympics coach that we recruited. Oh, nice. We also have Chris Winkle, who coaches our Polars team, and he also is a non-parent coach as well. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't have a player on the team. No. He just coaches because he loves the game. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's awesome. Now, how did you pay for this? Ice time is not cheap. We've had to do a lot of recruiting, but a lot of funders have come to us. We have Edina Rotary is a huge funder of the program. Premier Bank also funded greatly. Minnesota Made Ice Center donated all of our ice for our Stingers team. We've gotten cont contributors from all over. Wow, that's awesome. Now, what I understand is it, it's new here, but special hockey is not really new. Is that right? Correct. Okay. There's 22 teams in the nation now from wow. all over. 
and that's what we're just kind of latching onto their program that's already in existence. And, and now do they, is, are the traveling teams, is there potential to travel now? Eventually, yes. We would like to send a team. They have an international team, they are international tournament, they have a national tournament, and teams from all over, from Canada, from Italy, everyone comes together to play. All to play special hockey. This mm -hmm. is absolutely awesome. Well, mm -hmm. we've, got, we've got some videos, so we're seeing some of the players on ice uh, enjoying the game and enjoying the sport, and I thank you both for, for bringing this program to Edina and all the special hockey players here in the metro area. And thanks a lot for being in Edina. We look forward to a, a great season. Thank, thank you. you. You bet. If people want more information, where should they go? You can log on to our website at www.mnspecialhockey.org. All right. Thanks a lot. Go teams. Thanks. Thank you. Well, from hockey's ice to the dome's turf, let's find out what the golfers are doing to get their swing in shape over at Braemar's Golf Dome. Well, it might be a little cold outside, but I'll tell you what, things are heating up right inside the Braemar Golf Dome. And joining me to talk about it is Todd Anderson, manager of the Dome and assistant manager of the Braemar Course. Hello. Hello. I am so excited to be here. Thanks for coming today. Thanks for having us on in Adina. Tell us a little bit about this fabulous dome. It's one of the oldest around, isn't it? It is. One of the first in the country. It is, uh, was put in 1983. Um, it's 270 feet long by 230 feet wide and 75 feet tall with 46 tees uh, and we can accommodate uh, up to 100 golfers. That time. What I like about it is you can really see the trajectory of your ball. Definitely can Unlike hit. those net places. Yes, can hit every club in the bag yeah. and see it. So you can go top to bottom and you can also work on the short game. Definitely. You got a little putting area here. Yep, chipping and putting and a lot of people work on that a big portion of the time. And isn't this the time when golfers should really be working on their game? Oh, definitely. You can prepare for a trip or uh, prepare for the season too. And you offer some lessons to help people get ready? Yes, we've got a group lesson that runs in February through March. Um, then we move outside uh, in, in April, and then we also do offer private lessons. And of course, in Minnesota, the weather is on and off again. So if, if we can't practice outside, we can bring it on in here, yep, right? Yep, come on back inside, yep. OK, great. So um, you offer group lessons. Is that twice a week? How twice long are a week, they? yes, going for two and a half weeks. Okay, so that's like a five-hour lesson at a time, Correct. and you can work on all parts of the game, plus the one-on-one -on -one with six different teaching pros, right? Correct. We've got the best pro staff in the state. Awesome. Well, I, I really appreciate you bringing one of your best with me uh, to help my game, because I'm looking at uh, improving my game. Joe Gertner is here. He's a uh, head teaching pro. He here, is. Uh, of the Braemar course, and uh, Hi, nice I really you appreciate coming. you coming. Todd, thanks so Thank much. You. Thanks a lot for having us here. I'm really excited to get a tip or two from you, but what's something that all us golfers can be working on right now in the middle of winter? Well, winter is a great time to make changes in your golf swing, better than probably in the summer when you're playing. One of the things you can do in the winter is work on your flexibility and strengthening. If you want to hit the ball farther, you've got to be stronger and you want to move the club faster. One of the things that we like to use is weighted clubs to try to get you to increase your strength and flexibility. You can do that in the dome here and at home and, and really get a good start on next year. Yeah, you know, if you lay off on the game and people go out in the springtime and they're hacking the ball right away, so it's might as well try to keep yourself going year round. The hardest things in Minnesota is you've got a, you've got a winter and if you take the whole winter off, you're starting over every spring. You don't need to do that. With the golf dome here, you can keep your game. In fact, you can improve your game. Now what, what's the best part of having a pro work with you? Of the one-on-one -on -one attention, but you also get some benefit out of the group. The group is, is good. It depends on how you like to learn, and of course it's a little less expensive to take a group than to take private lessons. But the real advantage is having someone there to ensure that your practice is correct. If you're practicing wrong, you're going to groove some habits that are very tough to change, and so you actually can get worse if you're practicing wrong. So having a pro there, just make sure that you practice correctly and you're working on the right things. Well, now that I've got a pro right here, how about taking a look at my swing? I'd love to. Answers. I'd really love appreciate to. it. All right, I'm just kind of grab, uh, just grab a little nine iron here. All right, take again, a swing for me. Let's again. see what you got. With or without the ball. Am I know? safe here? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, all right, you always address the ball and give it a swing and see how we do. Now, Joe, you got me nervous here, but I could really use your help. Wow. Wow. Pretty good. I think I've been using that weighted club. Have you been in here a lot practicing? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> that was very good. Well, that thanks. was very good. Uh, just a couple things that I would I would look at there. Your grip is a little bit uh, it, a little bit what we would Come call strong. Me. Your grip is a little bit more underneath. Your right hand uh -huh. could be a little bit more square to the club. You were a little bit too far under there. Okay. That would create a problem with height to your golf shots. Okay. The other thing that I noticed is you're a little bit too far away in your setup. Ah. Good players tend to let their arms kind of hang down you were reaching out a little bit too much. That would create a problem with, with topping the ball if you got into a tough situation on the course that. to top it. <laughs> so, so you'd probably want to set up a little bit closer. The first thing we would probably work with you is your setup and your grip. And if we got that better, that would start to improve your swing, although that was a pretty good swing you made right there. Well, I might have got lucky on, on this try. That can happen. And But what I'm trying to do is consistency, and I know all the golfers want consistency in their game. Here's the place to do it, Braemar Golf Dome right here in the city of Edina. Have a great season. My thanks to Joe. My thanks to Todd. Thanks and for I'll, coming out. We'll be back, and I hope to see the rest of you out here, too. Thanks. You know, we talk a lot about transportation on this show, and there's a new project we want to draw some special attention to. It has to do with the West 70th Street Corridor, and joining us to talk about this project right now uh, from the Transportation Commission in the City of Edina, Les Wanager, and also the Director of Public Works, Wayne Hool. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Thanks for Thank having us. really appreciate this. Big mm -hmm. project, once again, fairly new project, though. Right. New study going on with uh, a company you've already got experience with. Tell us a little bit about the, um, the, the city hired SRF Consulting to be the facilitators and engineers for this project. Um, SRF Consulting has a, a long history in Edina. Um, they've, they've just completed the Northeast Edina traffic study, which included uh, West 50th Street to the north up to St. Louis Park in Minneapolis. Very successful project. Um, the city council just approved it uh, last November, and we're now going into the implementation stage um, with the different improvements throughout the area. So if it worked up there? They're looking forward to making it work here West right. 70th. Why West 70th? It, it's known for a long time that there's a lot of problems on, on the street. Uh, there's a very heavy traffic volume, which has been heavy since the 80s, uh, maybe even before the 80s, but we have data to show that. Uh, but what we found from the recent data that's collected is that 85% of the people are speeding on the street. Wow. 85%. Okay. That's a lot. There are a lot. There's a number of crashes. There's a school in the area, Cornelia School, right on the, right on the 70th and Cornelia. There's a church down there. Um, people from the south have trouble accessing the street, uh, accessing 70th to get to where they want to go because that's, um, there's only one stoplight on the street. Uh, people from the north have a similar kind of problem. People who live on 70th Street have trouble getting out of their driveways. So there's plenty of reason to study it, and this was our number two priority issue as a commission right after in Northeast Edina. And you're not just looking at West 70th Street, but, no. but, but all the no. exchanges no. around. We, we could rename it the Cornelia Area Traffic Study because we're looking all the way from Crosstown Highway down to the Fred Richards Golf Course from Highway 100 to, um, to France Avenue. And, you, and you've made no decisions about what to do. Add a lane, change right. this, put no. lights up, put no. lights down. No. There are rumors around, but no, no decisions have made, been made other than to study and try to improve the situation. People don't realize that there, there's a huge process that goes into this. That's right. You have to collect data and right. input. Right. And so it sounds like you've started the process of collecting data, right? That's, and that's right. now you need some input. Exactly. Okay. Um, to the beginning of the, of the process here, we've been going through the public hearings, and then there's always uh, comment periods where people can write in emails, uh, send in letters uh, through the whole process, and then we'll be bringing it back to, to the residents as far as getting additional input once, once the problems have been identified and potential solutions identified. Well, with uh, people not being able to get out of their driveways and children that are trying to get to school, resident opinion is pretty doggone important here. Of course it is. So you, yeah. you've handled some uh, focus groups and collected input there. And on the timeline, what's next? In March? In, uh, in March, we'll, we'll consolidate, uh, have, have the data consolidated that we gathered through the public hearings and through the comments we've received, et cetera, and, uh, and from the data from the traffic consultant. And then in, in April, we'll sit down with a study advisory uh, committee, which we're forming to augment the commission. We'll have residents from the area. We'll have a couple business people re representing that area. We'll have people from MnDOT, from Hennepin County, because they have jurisdiction over the sure. intersection. So we'll try to get all the players, somebody from the school, somebody from the church, sure. just make sure we're getting all the inputs so that as, um, and then we'll ask the consultants to, uh, to take what we've sort of prioritized as the issues, maybe narrow 50 down to the top 10 that are clearly the ones we have to address ask the traffic consultants to come up with alternative solutions and of course some residents will have suggested some things we, sure. we will look at as well yeah 
and then they'll come back to us over, over a period of, of a number of months mm -hmm. as, we, as we get sort of draft versions of this thing. We'll, we'll have public hearings and all that, and so we'll get more feedback about the solutions then as opposed to the, uh, the problems. And it's important. It's a, it's a residential <coughs> feel area, too. Right. So um, it's really important that right. people take some time and get involved in this process, and you're right. encouraging that. Right. That's great. Problems yeah. have been going on for over 20 years, so yeah. you know we don't have to try to solve this in a day. We have to, but we have to get at it and, and do what we can. And of course, with every solution, there's going to be a price tag. Exactly. So then you're going to have to work through that financial exactly. process as well. Right. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. What should people do if they want to get involved? Um, well, the, the city has a website, and they can they can uh, get involved in that regard. They can come to the public hearings, which are always uh, you know announced and broadcast well. We send out letters to the residents of the area to inform them of various hearings. Uh, we will have the, they can attend our meetings. All of meetings, of course, are open to the public. Uh, their, their meetings conducted in public, but we'll have the hearings when they can when they can, they can speak, and then other times when we have to sit and discuss that. So. It'll all be a very open process. Wonderful. When do you feel like there might be a solution to this? Are you projecting out a year or two? I'm guessing about a year. Okay, great. Well, we'll have you back once again to find out what the outcomes are and follow the progress along the way. And hopefully we can get that speed down. Holy smokes. 85% yeah, yeah. of the people are speeding yeah. through there. Right. We want to make it safe yeah. for everybody. Yes, we do. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for joining us on Inadina. Thanks, Thanks for you. having us. Yep. All this talk about transportation today is building up my appetite. Maybe we ought to go on over to the kitchen and see what's there to eat. Well, if your appetite is revving up, I've got just the place for you. Try a brand new restaurant in the Galleria called Crave, located upstairs in the Galleria right here in the city of Edina. And joining us is the executive chef, Eli Wallenstein. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for having us, Lillian. Really appreciate you coming and bringing all the goodies to boot. Oh, and we're very excited about being open here in the Galleria. Tell us about Crave, what well, a great Crave, name. Yeah, and Crave is a wonderful new concept, uh, really designed around the people of Edina and the people of the Galleria, and, and who, did, who request a little more intelligent and sophisticated dining experience. Mm -hmm. And so we've created a wonderfully and beautiful restaurant here in the Galleria that, that is very warm and inviting and very upscale and elegant, yet, yet you can feel welcome whether you come for dinner, for lunch or, or come later at night for There's drinks. There's a fireplace in yeah, there. Yeah, beautiful fireplace. We are, the center of the restaurant is this beautiful ceiling to floor glass wine case and, and it really gives you a great warm feeling when you're in there. With 125 bottle wine selection. Yes, a, a huge wine list of some of the best wines in the area right now. Awesome. Yeah, it is. So it's so for great. lunch and for dinner? Lunch, dinner, and late nights. You know, we're trying to get a late night scene going sure. here at Galleria and it's nice. been great so far. Moderately priced? Moderately priced. You know, we want to be able, we don't want to scare people with prices. We want you to come in and enjoy yourselves and, and be very, very inviting to families or, or couples or whoever whoever can come out. We don't want to be deterred by price. What's on the menu? Well, the menu is, is really focused on some wonderful local fresh and natural ingredients and this this is our pasta this is this is our penne and rotisserie chicken mm -hmm. um, like crave the name it smells we, really good it, lots of garlic and, and we, we, we utilize our rotisserie and, and some of the wonderful things we can do with that this is local Diné goat cheese with toasted pine nuts and roasted red peppers here we got our signature appetizer which is grilled pita bread organic hummus and actually a caramelized roasted garlic bulb which is really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Here we're, we're using a lot of, lot of organic vegetables again, and this is our organic beet salad with organic spring mix, a cilantro orange vinaigrette, and, and some local ama blue blue cheese crumbles. And, and you really try to, to, to patron the, the local market here we as do, well. We do, we do, because you know it's healthy for the environment, and it's healthy for yourselves, you know, and, and it supports the local, the local scene as well as we have independent owners that are local too that, that want to promote these small businesses. And, and health foods, I mean this is pretty nutritious. It is. I mean it's not going to weigh you down for no, items No, no, you know we're putting in fresh ingredients, all natural ingredients that make you walk away feeling like you ate something good and not walk away feeling upset to your stomach. This is unbelievable. Over this here. is our seared duck breast, which is very beautiful. This comes with a butternut squash broth. This is an Incan quinoa, which is an, a Latin American grain, one of the oldest grains known. And it's, it's very healthy for you. It has a lot of good health benefits, along with steamed spinach. And like I said, the seared duck breast, which you like to eat medium rare. Now, if you don't have time to sit down and linger over a long meal, you can grab some lunch. Yes, and, and, and our lunch is another great aspect of our, of our restaurant. This is a muffaletta sandwich. It's a traditional New Orleans-style muffaletta sandwich, which means it comes with provolone cheese, salami, ham on a toasted ciabatta roll, and a great olive mix. 
And one of the exciting things we're doing is our root vegetable chips, which again are a healthier way uh, rather than deep fried potato. We're Don't doing, feel so guilty. Yeah, that. we're doing some, beef, <laughs> some, some sweet potatoes and some beets and some Yukon Gold potatoes, and it really makes for a great combination. Now, this restaurant has a bona fide sushi chef. It does. And full time. Yeah, and that's what we're very excited about because people are really craving sushi right now in the Twin Cities. Really nice of you to invite Tony Lamb to join us today Hello. in the kitchen. Thanks a lot for coming. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Now, sushi is hot. Everybody's going for it. In fact, you're from Hawaii, right? Yes. Hotly sought after chef and a pleasure <laughs> to be here full time for the Crave. What are we making today? Um, it's, it's a roll I created especially just for Crave. It's called a Minnesota roll and it's uh, my homage to Minnesota to call the California roll is a homage to California. So, so every state has this signature sushi roll, and uh, Minnesota has its one now. Well, yeah, maybe. I don't know. It's just something I wanted to give back to Minnesota since uh, mo mo most of my career was here. So. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. So what's in it? Um, it's uh, walleye, baked maybe? walleye. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. It's baked walleye, which I put into mix here. It's baked walleye and um, celery, uh, chopped green onions, cheddar cheese, also smoke flavoring, and some... Uh, Japanese mayo and some shiracha to make a little mm. mix here. Mm, nice. We also have smelt roll here and then cucumber will also be going inside. So um, Now this is an art when you put this together. Why don't you go ahead and start some sure. of that and, and I'll just ask you some questions okay. as we're going along the way. Obviously it's a little bit of rice uh -huh. and then the signature dish that's going to go in here, the walleye right. mix for Minnesota's walleye sushi. Mm -hmm. What's the key? What's as far as rolling it? Um, putting it patience. together. <laughs> Great. So I'm not going to be making it, but you can. Right. <laughs> patience, and it's very meticulous. Okay. You know. And it is an art, and mm -hmm. I can see you You had some ingredients already pre-made, obviously. Yeah, just to save us time. Right. right. Mm -hmm. and, and the smelt mix, then, uh, anything in particular in that? No, it's just um, smelt roll, mm -hmm. which we're going to use to cover the, roll, the actual roll itself in. Kind of gives it a nice bright finish. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Makes it look, look, not look so plain. How healthy is sushi? Um, it's supposed to be very, very healthy for you. Unless you're on a low carb diet, you know, there's high um, mm -hmm. proteins in fish, which is more easily to uh, your body to digest than um, meat and, uh, you, know, omega, you know, omega fatty three acids and sure. stuff like that. So Now, this is the key right here, this little roll. Little thing, right? it, you can do it without it, but it helps to make it nice and even. Mm -hmm. So you make sure everything's nice and tucked in there, roll it, and then put it on that. that and the plastic wrap? Well, keeps, how does that help? It just keeps the eggs from being scattered all over my mm, board and sure. being like a nice, big mess. Big mess. Yep. So here we go. Roll it like this to make it uniform. Put it on this side there. How much sushi are you producing for Crave? Oh, quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> because a lot of people are craving it. Yes, they are. Well, it is an art and it's absolutely beautiful. And of course, um, after you prepare the sushi, you cut it and you serve it. And what exactly um, is accompanying this uh, finished? It's uh, wasabi, which is uh, something that's very similar to uh, horseradish. Mm -hmm. It gives it a little spice and a little flavoring with the soy sauce. And then this is pickled ginger, which a lot of people use to cleanse the palates between bites. But now in this time of age, people just eat it however they want. They eat it with the sushi between bites or some don't even eat it at all. So. Mm -hmm. What's well, really popular, mm -hmm. and the restaurant Crave is really lucky to have you. I'm going to actually take a little sample of that. Sure, Do you mind go, if I just try this one right here? Yeah. Just kind of give a little taste test just to see how this Minnesota walleye sushi is. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. That's delicious. Now, the wrap, is that? Is seaweed. That a, mm, it's dry seaweed. seaweed. Mm. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous. Right. Mm. Thank you very much. No, well, thank you. Tony, congratulations on your work. Thank you. Sushi Chef at Crave. Eli, thank you very much for your hard work. Thank you, Lillian. And bringing a fabulous place to find and dine here in the city of Edina. We'll have you back. Thank you. I want to thank the chefs from Crave for coming in and bringing these fabulous menu items. And a special thanks to all our guests appearing on In Edina. Remember, we're a program about the people, places, and activities right here in the city of Edina. I'm your host, Lillian McDonald. Thanks for watching. Until next time.